Do we have everyone in? Yes. Okay. Um, the Myra Mayen Patient Resource Center is delighted to have uh, Dr. Linda Nibobi uh, come back and talk to us about Parkinson's disease, uh, recognizing symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment strategies. Um, we had a wonderful talk with Dr. Nibobi and failed to get it recorded. And we are absolutely determined uh, to, to get it online this time because this is such a such a powerful topic and it affects so many people in the world. Uh, Dr. Nabobi offers compassionate and personalized care and movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism, essential tremor, Huntington's disease, dystonia, cervical dystonia, blepharat, I don't know. Spasm. <laughs> yes. Hemifacial spasm, tics, and Tourette syndrome, ataxia, gait disorder, chorea, restless leg syndrome, and myoclonus. Um, we are um, delighted to, to uh, welcome you back, Dr. Nabobi, and um, please uh, begin. And uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really um, happy to be back to give this talk again. Um, and this time it's going to be recorded um, so that you can uh, take a look at it later for, um, for reference purposes. Um, my name is Linda Nabobi. I am one of the movement disorders neurologists um, here at Cornell. Um, and as uh, Judy mentioned, I see patients who have Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders, um, but we mostly see Parkinson's disease um, as it's a, it's a very common neurodegenerative disease. So the talk today is going to focus focus on Parkinson's, um, what the symptoms are like, how to recognize them, what treatments we have available, um, and, and we'll also talk some epidemiology and also a little bit of research that we're doing in our institute. Okay, I do not have any disclosures related to this talk. Um, these are my objectives. So let's talk a little bit about Parkinson's disease, some of the epidemiology. Um, Parkinson's disease is actually very, very common. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disease next to Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's estimated to affect about one to 2% of the population over the age of 65. Um, I mentioned this because unfortunately, Parkinson's uh, uh, symptoms tend to show up around retirement age. So you can imagine that um, someone who has been working their whole life and is now looking forward to retirement and enjoying their life, and then they develop this diagnosis, it can be quite devastating. So it comes at a time in, in, in people's lives where they are looking forward to um, enjoying their retirement, unfortunately. Um, it affects men more than women in about a two to one ratio. Um, the age of onset, as I mentioned, the mean age is around 62.4 years. Um, and then we have a small percentage, about four to 10% of cases that happen before the age of 40. We call these people young onset Parkinson's disease. And it's quite rare for us to see someone have this disease before the age of 30. It's important to know that Parkinson's disease is very heterogeneous. No two people are alike. Everyone is going to look different, respond to medications differently, um, and have different prognosis. Um, and that's the reason why it's important to come to care to a doctor um, to have focus on your own disease um, and treatments must be individualized. I put these two individuals here because these are two very famous people, um, Muhammad Ali and Michael J. Fox, who both had, um, had and have Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's disease um, carries a huge burden both in this country and globally. The total cost of Parkinson's disease to individuals, families, and the government is about $52 billion every year. Um, about half of that is attributable to direct medical costs, so things like going into the hospital, things like medications, and then the other half um, is attributable to things like missed work, lost wages, um, being forced to retire early due to symptoms, and then also caregiver time. Um, so combined, about 52 billion. So this is a very, very expensive disease. Let's talk about the pathophysiology, what's happening in the brain with this disease. Um, in Parkinson's disease, people develop symptoms because you have a loss of the cells that make dopamines. We call these dopaminergic neurons. These cells are located in the part of the brain called the substantia nigra pars compacta. It's a mouthful. Um, and this is located in the part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which is in general responsible for movement, coordination of movements. Now, dopamine, this chemical that we all make, um, as the cell 
cells that make them slowly die off over time, you have less and less dopamine. And eventually, by the time you reach about 50% loss of these cells, you start to manifest symptoms, okay? Um, besides these dopamine-making cells, we also know that Parkinson's affects other parts of the brain, other different systems of the brain, which is why we also see several other symptoms in the disease besides movement symptoms, and we're going to get into this more. Another pathologic hallmark of Parkinson's that um, people often hear about are Lewy bodies. These are protein aggregates that accumulate in the brain um, in people who have Parkinson's disease and people who have also other neurodegenerative diseases such as dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, but this is one pathologic hallmark that we tend to see in the brain of people with Parkinson's, usually at autopsy um, when people um, try to make a, a, a final diagnosis. And then also in these Lewy bodies, we have this um, protein component called alpha-synuclein. These are all things that we have seen in the brains of people with Parkinson's, and we know that they are involved in the pathogenesis of the disease. Let's talk a little bit about um, risk factors and uh, the cause of Parkinson's. The short answer is we don't know exactly what causes Parkinson's, and we don't think that there is one cause. We know that there are several different factors that contribute to someone eventually developing Parkinson's. So far, what we know is that it's a combination of your genetics, your environment that you grew up in, and then just having an aging brain. These three things combined all add to the risk of developing Parkinson's. Um, many people have studied um, different factors to figure out what is it that you know can cause Parkinson's and what are things that can protect you from getting Parkinson's. So on the left here in red are some risk factors that have been studied and have shown to give you an increased risk of developing Parkinson's. So if you are someone who had um, multiple traumatic brain injury, for example, let's say you were a football player and you had a lot of concussions or tra multiple traumatic brain injuries, this puts you at higher risk of developing Parkinson's in the future. Exposure to pesticides, exposure to certain herbicides, for example, Agent Orange that um, um, some people who went to Vietnam war were exposed to, we do know that this increases your risk of developing Parkinson's. Um, certain solvents, um, exposure to manganese, so people who are welders, um, they get exposed to manganese and this can accumulate in the brain and develop um, symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, exposure to carbon monoxide, some people have done studies on dairy um, and they found, some people found that there is a risk with dairy and some people found that there is no risk with dairy, so we're not sure. Um, having a history of hepatitis B or C, having diabetes, depression, these are all things that have been found to have a slightly increased risk of developing Parkinson's in the future. Um, and then what are some things that are protective? So people also study, are there things that reduce your risk of developing Parkinson's in the future? One of the one that uh, we know consistently um, has a reduced risk of Parkinson's is cigarette smoking. We do not understand it, and we are definitely not encouraging our patients to go and smoke cigarettes to reduce their risk of developing Parkinson's. But we do know um, that when they've done studies and they compare people who are heavy or long-term smokers compared to people who are non-smokers, um, or they compare people who are non-smokers versus current smokers, they found that there's a two-fold reduction in Parkinson's disease risk developing the disease. Um, we're not sure exactly why, um, but we also know that all, all of our patients who do have Parkinson's Rarely do I ever have someone who's a smoker and has Parkinson's. I think I've only met one or two people who are smokers um, and have Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's just don't smoke. Again, something that we're trying to understand. Other things that have been studied, caffeine may be protective, estrogen may be protective. The fact that women are less likely to develop Parkinson's compared to men, um, the thought is that maybe estrogen is behind this. Um, certain teas, um, flavonoids, which are seen in berries, ibuprofen, these are, have also been studied and maybe they do have a protective um, uh, risk for Parkinson's. Let's talk about genes. So now we're learning more and more, not just in Parkinson's, but in medicine in general, that our genetics has a lot to do with why we develop certain diseases and somebody else does not, okay? Um, most of Parkinson's disease, about 90%, 95% is sporadic. It just happens, we're not sure why. But about five to 10%, we know it's genetic, um, meaning that you inherited a gene from your father or your mother and then that gene increases your risk of developing Parkinson's. And many, many genes have been studied, but we only know a fraction because there's so much more to be discovered. We only know a fraction of what genes are involved in Parkinson's. Um, 
And so two of the most common genetic risk factors for Parkinson's disease um, that we know, and these are usually in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Um, these are the LARC2 gene and the GBA gene. Some of you may have heard this. Um, LARC2 increases your, uh, is about 10 to 28% of people with um, genetic Parkinson's. GBA is about 11 to 31% of people. Um, and so those are two very common ones that we see, and it's usually in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. But other genes have also been studied. Um, I like this table because it's a, it's a continuum of different genes that have been looked at. Um, these these are the ones that are very rare, but then up here they have a very high um, risk of developing Parkinson's. So you see LARC2 up there, other ones are Parkin, um, pink one. Um, and then these are the ones that are more common, but they have a low risk of giving you Parkinson's. GBA is somewhere um, in the middle. Um, so we will talk more about genetics later, but in general, now that we know that genetics has a part to play in Parkinson's, this is being studied more with the goal of figuring out um, are there specific treatments that we can develop for people who have specific genes. So if you come in and we do genetic testing, we find that you have a specific gene for Parkinson's, can we develop a treatment that targets your specific Parkinson's? So that's one thing that research is doing now. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, trying to see if that we can find a cure for Parkinson's based on um, um, looking more into these genes. But ge genetic testing is something that we're doing more and more now so that people can find out whether they have one of these genes. Let's talk about the clinical features. And, and this is the part of Parkinson's that I like to talk about the most um, because I think it's really key to um, diagnose Parkinson's early. Um, a lot of times Parkinson's symptoms manifest as um, you know, slowness or stiffness, and it just looks like someone is getting older. And so people assume that, oh, you know, this person is shaking or they're slower because, you know, they're just getting older, not realizing that this could be Parkinson's disease. So I like to talk about this um, a lot because I like to educate people about what the symptoms are, things to look out for if your friend, um, parent, um, spouse has some of these symptoms to bring them to the care sooner than later. Okay. So let's talk about the different clinical features of Parkinson's. These are divided into three. So premotor, motor, and non-motor. We'll talk about the premotor first. So premotor means that these are symptoms that are happening for many, many years before someone eventually develops that first tremor or that first shuffling gait. Um, but these symptoms happen for many years. So some clues that we have, um, a reduced sense of smell. So people with Parkinson's lose their sense of smell many, many years before they develop their first physical um, symptom of Parkinson's. Um, constipation is another common one that can happen for years. REM sleep behavior disorder. This is when people act out their dreams. During the REM sleep cycle, you're supposed to be paralyzed and not move. And that's when you're dreaming. But in people with Parkinson's, they lose that um, ability, that paralysis that they're supposed to have during REM sleep and they act out their dreams. Oftentimes they have no idea that they're doing this. Usually it's the bed partner that suffers because they're getting hit in the face or they're hearing someone screaming all night. But this is one of the symptoms that happens in a, in a, in a significant number of people um, who have Parkinson's and it happens many many years before. It can even be up to 30 years before um, they develop the physical symptoms. Depression is a very common one and also anxiety too. Those two can happen years before the physical onset. And then sensory abnormalities and pain. People can have some cramping in their legs, um, some pain in the arm that's going to be affected eventually before they develop the physical symptoms. Um, and one of the hypotheses that has been proposed to explain why um, people have some of these symptoms before they develop the physical manifestation, it's called the Bragg's hypothesis. And this hypothesis stipulates that um, Parkinson's disease is caused by some pathogen that enters the body either via the nasal cavity or something that we eat and goes in through the guts. Um, and it initiates that Lewy body pathology in the guts that then spreads up through your nerves, the vagus nerve specifically, goes up into the brain. Um, and so if it goes through the nasal cavity that's why you have your sense of smell affected if it goes to the guts you get your constipation if it goes to the basal part of your brain you get um this REM sleep behavior disorder and as it moves up you start to get you know the physical symptoms but this is one hypothesis out there as to how Parkinson's happen um and many people are actually studying um the guts the function of the gut in Parkinson's disease my colleague Dr. Lee um being one of them um, but there's a lot of interest in this hypothesis 
Now let's move on to the motor symptoms. So these are the symptoms that manifest physically. These are the symptoms that eventually brings um, our patients to care. So um, I'll list uh, several of them for you. Um, slowness. So people with Parkinson's, they things, everything just becomes slow. Um, and the way that this manifests, it just can take you longer to put on your clothes, um, to, you know, for moving from one place to the other. Um, people just find that they're slower. You, you find that people are walking past you. Um, and then stiffness is another symptom. Usually affects one side for First, and then later can move on to the other side. Um, but the way that stiffness manifests is that people can find that they have more difficulty getting in, sitting in a chair or getting up from a chair, difficulty turning in bed at night or getting in and out of bed, difficulty getting into a car or, or getting up out of a car. Those are some ways that stiffness manifests. Another way, common way that stiffness manifests is um, stiffness of the arm that is going to eventually be affected in Parkinson's. And I cannot tell you how many times I've seen patients who ended up going to orthopedic doctor for um, frozen shoulder, not knowing that this is the onset of Parkinson's disease. So that's something to really watch out for. Tremor is a very, very common one. It's the most known or recognized symptom that we see in Parkinson's. Um, it's a rest type of tremor, meaning that you're completely relaxed and then you see the arm, you know, shaking. Okay, um, this is one of the first symptoms that people um, tend to get. Smaller handwriting, um, and again, another um, symptom that people tend to recognize first. So you, people notice that as they write and write more, the handwriting gets smaller and smaller and tinier, and it starts to fade away. Um, masked faces, which means a reduction in facial expression. People with Parkinson's tend to have this look of... Um, it's just less expression. Um, a lot of times they look like they're depressed, but they're not depressed. They just are not moving their facial muscles as they used to. Um, and they may find that one side of the face does not move as well as the other side. Um, reduced blinking, again, another um, slowness of movement. So people with Parkinson's just don't blink as much and they tend to kind of just have this stare. Um, a stooped posture, so the, the, the neck bends and, they, and um, and you can become curved. Um, again, another um, symptom of Parkinson's that um, can happen at the beginning. Shuffling gait. This is another common symptom that people recognize. So, don't you know people with Parkinson's don't pick up their feet as well when they when they walk. So, very reduced striking of their heel, and so they just kind of shuffle forward. Um, reduced arm swing usually starts on one side. Um, oftentimes, the person that this is happening to does not notice it. Is somebody else, a family member or a friend or a spouse that um, notices it and says, you're not swinging your right arm or your left arm that well. A reduction in the, in, in the, in the voice, a low voice reduction in your volume of speech. This is called hypophonia. So the volume of speech reduces. Um, Again, one of the early symptoms that may be noticed. Slurred speech can occur. Usually this happens later on um, in the disease. Trouble swallowing can also occur. Again, occurs later on um, in, in more um, advanced disease. Drooling is one of the symptoms that we see in Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's um, do not swallow their saliva. We all subconsciously swallow our saliva every few seconds without even realizing we're doing it. People with Parkinson's are not doing that as much. So there's pulling of saliva in the mouth. Um, and then that can cause drooling. Poor balance is one of the core symptoms for Parkinson's. Again, this usually happens a couple of years after initial onset of symptoms, but it's one of the core features. Freezing of gait is a symptom of Parkinson's um, that happens basically when you're trying to walk, you find that your feet are stuck to the ground. It tends to happen when um, someone is trying to initiate walking or when um, the person is trying to turn a corner. Or it can also happen when walking through trying to maneuver tight spaces or going through doorways or elevator doors. That's when freezing tends to happen. It's not an issue with the legs. The legs are fine. It's an issue with the communication of the brain to the legs, down the legs. It's time to move and then the person freezes and there are different maneuvers to get out of freezing when it happens. Blurred vision, vision can be affected in Parkinson's. Usually there's a blurring of vision. Eye movements can also become a little bit slow in Parkinson's. Um, abnormal posturing, which we call the medical term for that is dystonia. Um, the most common one that we see in Parkinson's is curling of the toes, tends to happen in the evening at nighttime. Um, it can also happen in the hands, so some curling of the hands, and um, we, we do botulinum toxin injection um, for this, and it works very well for it. Um, difficulty turning in bed, again, another way that stiffness um, manifests. But there are several, several motor symptoms of Parkinson's, as I just went over. 
And then there are also many non-motor symptoms. So these are the other symptoms of Parkinson's that people usually don't know about, um, but they tend to come along with the motor symptoms also. Um, autonomic dysfunction. So Parkinson's affects your autonomic nervous system. This is the part of your body, um, of your nervous system that's responsible for things like monitoring your blood pressure, monitoring your heart rate, um, urination, bowel movements, the sexual activity. These are things that you just don't even think about, but your nervous, this autonomic nervous system controls all of these functions. And part Parkinson's disease unfortunately affects it. So people with Parkinson's can develop symptoms of um, dysfunction, including orthostatic hypotension, your blood pressure drops, um, gastroparesis, your stomach just kind of sits there and doesn't contract and move, um, constipation because your gut is not moving, everything just kind of sits still, um, dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing, um, drooling, um, abnormal sweating because you have um, um, uh, dysfunction of your of your uh, from a regulatory um, apparatus, and then urinary issues. So there can be urinary frequency, urgency, incontinence, um, all as a result of this autonomic dysfunction. And also sexual dysfunction um, can be common um, as a result as a result of um, of this. And then mood disorders, very 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 common in Parkinson's: depression, anxiety, apathy, which is a lack of motivation to do anything, and then impulse compose, control disorders, impulsivity, which can be caused by the disease, but can also be caused, um, exacerbated by some of the medications that we use. Sleep disorders are very common in Parkinson's. Most common is insomnia. Um, muscle cramps can happen at night. REM sleep behavior disorder, which I, I, I mentioned, um, having very vivid dreams um, or nightmares, having restless legs, um, nocturia, getting up frequently at nighttime to use the bathroom, um, very common. And then daytime sleepiness. Fatigue is a very common one. This is a difficult one to treat, but it's, it's very, very common in Parkinson's. And then visual spatial problems, um, having difficulty um, trying to figure out your position in space. Um, people with Parkinson's, sometimes when they try to sit down, um, they don't um, kind of um, measure out correctly where the chair is and they tend to start sitting in the corner of the chair. Or when they're walking into rooms, they tend to walk too close to one side of the, of the doorway. So it's just um, uh, an, an issue with calculating your, um, your surrounding, um, uh, the distance uh, to, to things as you walk around or try and move around. And then cognitive problems and dementia um, can happen in Parkinson's. This happens in advanced Parkinson's when people develop dementia, it's called Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, and that's something else that um, we treat um, if it happens. People with Parkinson's, a good percentage of people do develop mild cognitive impairments. Um, so, you know, a little bit of forgetfulness. And this is something that we see commonly um, in early slash mid disease. Psychosis and hallucinations can happen as part of Parkinson's disease, um, dementia, or on their own. Again, something that can happen in advanced uh, disease. And then pain, um, unfortunately, can happen with um, cramping, stiffness, um, all the other symptoms that come with Parkinson's. Now, how do we diagnose Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a clinical diagnosis, meaning that someone comes to me um, or to your doctor and they say, you know, I'm having these symptoms, they get examined. And if you're checking off many of the boxes of what we're looking for in Parkinson's, we then give you the diagnosis. It's a clinical diagnosis based on our clinical interpretation. Okay. And so there, the main things that we're looking for are some of those motor symptoms that I um that I um, uh, mentioned, okay? So I'm going to ask you several questions. Are you having this symptom, that symptom? And then I examine you and I'm looking for bradykinesia, which is slowness of movements. So slowness or a decrease or a delay in movements, okay? I'm looking for rigidity, stiffness of the body, okay? So I move your body around and I look at how you, um, how you, how you move, how you get up, get up and sit in the chair. And that tells me how much rigidity that you have. And I'm looking for that tremor. I love to see that rest and tremor. Is it necessary to have it? No, but I would like to see it. We see it in about 70% of, of patients. That rest tremor tells me, gives me more confidence I'm dealing with Parkinson's disease. Usually it starts on one side, um, but then can move to the, um, to the other side. Um, this tremor, unfortunately, is one of the things that's harder to control in Parkinson's. A lot of times they may not respond to levodopa, which is the main treatment that we have for Parkinson's. Um, to make the diagnosis, we need at least two out of three of these symptoms and bradykinesia, slowness of movements has to be in there, okay? 
And then there are other supportive features that we're looking for in Parkinson's. We like to see that it starts on one side. If you have symmetric symptoms, it makes us worry that you may have one of the other diseases that looks like Parkinson's. Um, response to Parkinson's disease medication, we wanna see a good response. Someone who's not responding well or has no response, it also makes us worry that you may have one of the other diseases, the atypical Parkinsonisms. Um, we also look for the pre-motor symptoms and the non-motor symptoms. So if you come to me and you have a little slowness, I'm not seeing anything else, you don't have rest sleep behavior disorder, you don't have um, um, constipation, uh, you're, you're a smoker, you just don't have all the other things that fit, it makes me wonder that maybe it's not Parkinson's. But if you're checking off all those boxes for me, you have those pre-motor symptoms, the non-motor symptoms, in addition to your physical symptoms, it makes me feel com more confident that this is Parkinson's disease. Um, a DAT scan is a scan that, um, it's a dopamine scan, it's a scan that's looking for dopamine uptake in the brain. It's a scan that we can do um, as adjunctive um, uh, diagnostic um, um, uh, something a diagnostic test that we can do to help us determine um, if you have reduction of dopamine. Um, I rarely get a DAT scan in my patients. Um, I, I see my patients when I make a clinical diagnosis. If someone is coming to me and symptoms don't exactly fit or the, the symptoms are not progressing the way it should, I wonder, could we be dealing with something else? And then I get a DAT scan. Again, it's supportive, but it's not necessary to make a diagnosis. And then we also look for other features. Do they have, does the person have other features concerning for an atypical Parkinsonism, one of the other diseases, which I'll mention in the next slide. Um, and if there, there's no evidence of those other symptoms, then I feel more confident that this is Parkinson's. Okay. Um, these are the differential diagnoses, other diseases that we think about when someone comes to us with concern for Parkinson's. So essential tremor, also known as benign tremor, is another disease that we commonly see. And this is just someone who has a tremor, usually affects both hands. Um, and so we also test for that to make sure that this is not just essential tremor. Um, normal pressure hydrocephalus is a disease that affects walking. Um, and we would see certain findings on brain imaging to support that diagnosis. The rest of these diseases out here, these are called atypical Parkinsonian syndromes. Um, these diseases also tend to have reduction of dopamine in the brain. They tend to look like Parkinson's, but they all have additional features um, that we look for to suggest that this could be the diagnosis. These diseases tend to progress faster than Parkinson's disease, and they do not respond well to, um, to the the, the Parkinson's disease medication. So we also think about these diseases. Um, they include progressive supranuclear palsy, multi-system atrophy, cortical basal ganglionic degeneration, Lewy body dementia, drug-induced Parkinsonism, vascular Parkinsonism, Huntington's disease, spinal cerebral ataxia. These are some of the other diseases that can look like Parkinson's, but they are not Parkinson's disease, okay? So we always keep these in mind whenever we see a patient. Again, there are no specific diagnostic tests, but we may get a DAT scan based on what, you know, what we're thinking. We may get an MRI brain. We may get an FDG PET scan, um, which could help us elucidate. If we think that you have one of those Parkinsonisms, but we're not sure which one, we may get an FDG PET scan to help us figure out um, which type you have. But again, this test is not exactly conclusive um, and we don't get it often. A levodopa challenge is basically giving someone levodopa, the medication for um, Parkinson's, to see if they respond to it. Sometimes we may do a smell test, given that people with Parkinson's, their sense of smell is reduced. We may do a smell test just to see what the, um, if there's a reduction in smell and if it's reduced, that helps tell us that we're dealing with Parkinson's or one of the other similar ones. Um, we rarely ever get blood tests, but in someone, let's say someone who's young um, and should not be having Parkinson's at this age, we test for a couple of other things. And then genetic testing um, is, is important in people who have significant family history, but also in those who do not, if they wanna get genetic testing and know if they have one of the genes, um, I, I do encourage that in, in all my patients. Let's move on to treatment. Um, I like that this is one of the diseases in neurology that we have several treatments for. This disease has been around for many, many years that we've known of it. Um, and scientists um, and clinicians have worked very, very hard to come up with treatments to help uh, the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, it's important to know that, um, many of you may know that there is no cure for, cure for Parkinson's at this time. However, these medications, what they do is that um, they help treat the symptoms of Parkinson's. And these are all the different classes. I'm going to go through each one um, very quickly, just so you all get a sense of all the different medication options that are available. Um, this is generally how Parkinson's disease medications work. So in general, the goal of the medication is to give you back the dopamine that you're missing. 
So either to replace the dopamine or enhance the action of, of the dopamine in the brain um, or bind to receptors that, uh, um, that, that will um, allow dopamine to work. Okay, so this is a, a brief schematic and then I'm going to go over each medication. So carbidopa levodopa is the main medication, is the most potent medication that we have for Parkinson's disease. Levodopa is the main active ingredient. Levodopa literally goes into the body and becomes dopamine, hence the name. Carbidopa is just a part, is a additional medication that we put into levodopa to help it work better. It prevents breakdown of levodopa in your body. So it allows levodopa to go to the brain where we need it to work, okay? That's why they both um, come together. Um, it's the most potent drug that we have for Parkinson's. It's very good for tremor, stiffness, slowness, and it comes in different forms. Um, and these are all the brands. There's an immediate release from, there's a form, there's a controlled release form, there's a disintegrating form. Um, there's a combination of immediate release and extended release. Um, there's an enterolong, which is a gel um, that goes into a, a, a port that goes into your stomach and so you don't have to take pills and it, it gives you a continuous infusion of, of um, levodopa. And then there's an inhaled form. Um, tips about levodopa, it's best to take it on an empty stomach. Um, that way it goes into your body faster, kicks in faster. Levodopa does not like food in the stomach because then they will fight for attention. So you like, you, it's best to take it on an empty stomach so that it can work faster. However, the medication can cause stomach side effects. It can cause stomach upset. So if you're one of those people who get stomach upset with the medicine, you can take it with food, it's okay. Um, if you're having a lot of stomach upset, we can also add an additional carpidopa um, to help to help reduce those side effects. Um, other potential side effects of, of uh, levodopa, um, it can cause sleepiness. Um, I mentioned the, the stomach upset, so nausea, some constipation, it can cause loss of appetite. Um, it can worsen hallucinations in people who already have hallucinations. Um, it can worsen confusion. It can um, worsen dyskinesia, which are these excessive movements that can happen in Parkinson's, and I'll mention that later. And then it can also drop your blood pressure um, and cause orthostatic hypotension. I just wanted to show pictures of the um, the uh, the other levodopa forms, the non-pure forms. So this is Ambresia. It's the brand name for um, the inhaled levodopa. And basically, these are the capsules um, that contain the levodopa. Um, you put the capsules in this apparatus. You um, open it up and you inhale it. Um, and it's very helpful for people who suddenly wear off and they need a quick um, a quick relief. Um, for their medication to kick in. Um, and then this is the intestinal levodopa gel system. Um, basically a port is placed in your stomach. Um, it's a connected to a, a, a very thin wire where the gel, the levodopa gel goes in and you get continuous infusion of levodopa um, all day. And then other medications, let's move on to COMT inhibitors. Um, these are medications that we give with levodopa. It helps levodopa work better. So if you're someone who's been on levodopa for a few years and you find that you're not getting as strong of a benefit, we can add these medications um, uh, to help. Uh, if we have you on this medication, we monitor your liver function every six months. Potential side effects include um, discoloration of urine, confusion. It can worsen hallucinations, diarrhea, again, dyskinesia. Um, and then hepatotoxicity. Dopamine agonists are another class of medications that we use. They work very well. Um, we tend to start to use them in people who, have, who are younger when they first develop the disease. So people in their 40s, 50s, we like to use this first before doing levodopa. Um, and these are the different available forms. There's a pill form, patch form, um, and it's also an injection form. The injection form is for people who suddenly wear off. You can, let's say you're at the supermarket and you wear off, you can, quickly inject it into yourself and then you come back on. And it's also a sublingual form, which um, dissolves in the mouth. Um, with this medication, main side effects that we worry about um, are impulse control disorders, to so excessive, doing things excessively, excessive spending, eating, gambling, hypersexuality, um, just anything excessive. I had, um, I, I have, I had one patient who was, um, giving out money to people excessively just became very generous. So it's something to really watch out for. It can happen with this medicine. Um, again, excessive daytime sleepiness or suddenly falling asleep can happen with dopamine agonists, um, nausea, of vomiting, dizziness, orthostatic hypertension and hallucinations um, can be triggered by this medication. MAOB inhibitors are another class of medications that we have. Um, we can use them on their own or in combination with levodopa, uh, and they all come in uh, in pure form. Um, it's important to know that there are there are a lot of um, 
um, warnings out there that you cannot take this class of medications with um, antidepressants, usually the SSRIs. However, the dose that we prescribe this medication at is safe to be taken with SSRIs. So I often get this question from many patients, it is safe to take. Also safe to take this medication uh, with cheese and wine. Um, it's okay if you're taking them in moderate consumption. You may see that online if you're on one of these medications. Um, potential side effects, it can cause nausea, dry mouth, insomnia, lightheadedness, confusion, constipation, and can worsen um, dyskinesia. Amantadine is a very old drug that we use in Parkinson's. Um, it's very good for dyskinesia, but can also give you mild benefit for your Parkinson's symptoms. Um, it comes in, um, in all um, uh, tablet and capsule form. There's an extended release form and there's an immediate release form. Um, two main side effects to know is that this medication can cause um, edema, so swelling at the ankles and the leg, and it can also cause this rash called bifidio reticularis. It's this kind of lacy pattern rash. It's not dangerous. If it happens, let your doctor know. Um, and it's something that we can just keep an eye on, and we just weigh risk benefit as to whether to continue the medication. Anticholinergics are a class of medications that we also use in Parkinson's. Um, they're used to treat pe for people who have very difficult tremor um, and also um, the, the abnormal posturing that can happen in Parkinson's. Um, one of the limitations of using this medication is that um, it can cause cognitive issues, which many of our patients already have, so that limits us from trying this medication. But in someone who doesn't have significant cognitive issues, it can be very, very good for tremor and dystonia. Estradefalin is a newer medication. I think it's the newest medication that we have in Parkinson's disease. It was just approved in 2019, um, and we can use it as an adjunct therapy. And what it's hopefully um, going to do is to smooth out the day. So if you're someone who has a lot of fluctuations all day, you're on, then you're off, then you're on, then you're off, um, this medication can help kind of smooth you out. Um, it's a newer medication and we're learning more about it. Um, potential side effects is that it can worsen dyskinesia if you have dyskinesia, um, constipation, nausea, dizziness, hallucinations, insomnia, and reduced appetite. Rivastigmine is a medication that's used to treat, um, the main reason, uh, the main um, indication for rivastigmine is for people who have um, dementia, Alzheimer's dementia, but some studies have shown that it can, um, it can help with gait and balance problems in Parkinson's. So sometimes we put our patients um, who are having uh, balance problems or falls on it to see if it helps. Uh, and the dose that's recommended is at 12 milligrams. These are some potential side effects of the medication. And then botulinum toxin commonly known as Botox, but it's botulinum toxin and there are different types. There's Botox, Dysport, Zeomine, Myoblock. Um, basically, it helps to treat tremor um, and dystonia. So if you have dystonic posture, we can inject Botox. Um, you have to get the injection every three months um, because the toxin eventually wears off. Okay. Um, we also use this to treat sialuria, so excessive drooling. Um, and it's a very simple injection into the um, parotid glands, um, and it will reduce the amount of drooling that you have. Exercise. I love talking about exercise. Um, you know, I mentioned all these medications, but as I mentioned before, none of these medications um, stop the progression of the disease. None of them cure the disease. The one thing that we may have some hope on um, and has the potential of slowing down Parkinson's is exercise and physical activity, believe it or not. So all my patients, regardless of what stage you are, I tell everyone um, to, to exercise. Um, and research is clearly showing us that um, it helps symptoms um, and it helps the brain compensate for any of the changes that are happening in Parkinson's um, and it improves um, um, many, many different aspects of Parkinson's and also improves with your cognition, improves your motivation, your engagement, um, you know, because being, having this disease can be tough. Um, I, I recommend exercise for every single patient I have. Do as much as you can. Um, and this is something that our studies have shown. Um, as I mentioned, it have, helps maintain your balance and mobility and your activities of daily living. Um, I recommend everyone to do stretching exercises, to do aerobic big exercise and also to do strengthening exercise. Um, studies have shown that doing aerobic exercise, so something that gets your heart rate going up, something that gets you sweating, um, it's better than doing sedentary exercise. For example, sitting in a chair and raising your arms. That's good, but I would want all my patients to do something that gets them going and encourages big movements, okay? I tell everyone, um, I don't care what you're doing, you don't have to be in the gym, do whatever you love. So it could be cycling, it could be dancing, it could be swimming, Tai Chi, yoga, Pilates, boxing. There are so many programs out there to encourage people with Parkinson's to exercise. So I tell my patients, do whatever it is that you can, as long as you're moving, 
okay? Um, physical therapy and occupational therapy. I recommend physical therapy for anyone who's having balance issues or having falls. Try and use up as much physical therapy that your insurance will allow you every year. Consider physical therapy a part of your life and just continue doing it all the time. Occupational therapy for anyone having dexterity issues, issues manipulating things around the home. Occupational therapy can be very, very helpful. And then there are Parkinson's disease specific exercise programs. So there's dance for Parkinson's, there's rock steady boxing, there's LSVT, Leo Silverman voice um, treatments. Um, there's big and loud um, with LSVT, Leo Silverman uh, voice treatment. It's a specific Parkinson's disease specific exercise program that was developed years ago. And when you go to physical therapy, we try to send our patients to physical therapists who are trained in LSVT so that you can get Parkinson's disease specific um, physical therapy. Um, I find LSVT to be excellent. I encourage all my patients to do it as much as they can. Usually it's four days a week, four weeks, and you come out basically a new person. And I find it very, very helpful for my patients. Um, and then these are some organizations um, that are involved in, with Parkinson's that have a lot of free online exercise programs and also sometimes in-person exercise programs. Let's talk a little bit about, about advancing Parkinson's. Um, this is what happens when someone has uh, new Parkinson's, early Parkinson's, and we give them medication. This is what we expect to see, okay? So we expect to see a very nice response to the medication. You take your medication, um, you have increase of levodopa in your body, so more dopamine, and so you feel better, the stiffness re relaxes, um, your tremor reduces, and you just generally feel better, okay? And so this, so this is called um, your on time, okay? And then over time, your medication starts to wear off, for some people, it can be six hours. Some people, it can be four hours. Everyone is different. The medication starts to wear off. And so now you're going back down. And this is your off time. Okay, your symptoms are not controlled. And so you take your pill again. And the goal is to catch, your, catch the symptoms before you completely go off so that you maintain a kind of a steady state all day where you're on all day. Okay, so you take your pill, symptoms um, reduce. And then over time, it wears off. You take your pill again. And you kind of do that all day. That's early Parkinson's. As your disease progresses, um, people develop more motor fluctuations. So you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off. The medication, the duration is not as much as it was before. So instead of lasting you six hours, it's not lasting you four hours or three hours. And then you find that you need to take more medication. Um, as the disease progresses, remember, it's, it's, um, you, you're losing dopamine cells. The few cells that are left, they become so sensitive that every time they see even a little bit of dopamine, they get excited, okay? And so when they get super excited, you develop what we call dyskinesia, the excessive movements that some of you may have seen Michael J. Fox um, have on TV. These are called dyskinesia. And this happens because your disease is progressing you have fewer and fewer of those cells and whatever cells that are left are just so sensitive to any dopamine that they move too much. Your body moves too much when they see even a little dopamine. So it's a combination of your disease progressing and the medication. That's what causes this condition. And so when you take your medication as the disease advances, so right here, you're off. You take your medicine, now you're on. You're in your nice sweet spot, okay? You're feeling good. And then, you know, your very sensitive cells, they get too active and then you get dyskinesia in this range. And so you're kind of doing this all day, on, off, on, off, all day, and then dyskinesia somewhere, you know, up here, okay? And so the goal that we have as movement disorders neurologists is to keep you in this nice sweet spot where you're not too on, now where you're not too dyskinetic and where you're not too off. And that becomes a challenge as the disease progresses. What are some risk factors for developing these motor fluctuations? Um, if you're someone who developed the disease at a younger age, you're more at risk for developing this. Um, if you've been on levodopa for a long time, that increases your risk over time of developing this dyskinesia. And then if you've had the disease um, for a long time, so the more neurodegeneration you have, the more cells you're losing, the higher your risk of developing dyskinesia. And then being on a higher dose of the medication also increases your risk. What do we do about these symptoms when they happen? So we have different, different strategies that we apply. We can increase your levodopa or we can shorten your, the interval between the doses. So instead of taking it every um, five hours, we tell you, okay, take it every three and a half hours, something like that. We can add on um, medications to levodopa, so the different medications I mentioned, the monoamine oxidase beta inhibitor, COMT inhibitors, dopamine agonists. Um, we can also use immediate release fast acting agents.
And so if you're someone who um, you find that the medication is taking too long to kick in for you, we can try one of these. So the dissolving one, the embrasure, the inhaler, um, the injection, um, these you can take if you suddenly find that you're wearing off or if your medication is not kicking in fast enough. And then we can use the long acting forms of bivadopa, which lasts um, a long, longer time compared to the immediate release. Um, and then also the surgical options, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. When we get to the point where medications are not optimally controlling your symptoms, we then start to think about, you know, surgical options, um, which I will talk about next. So deep brain stimulation is one of the oldest surgical options that we have. Um, essentially, what's happening is that um, a surgeon, it's a surgery, you have electrodes placed in the basal ganglia part of your brain. So this is a nice schematic of it. It's a, think of a skinny needle that goes into the brain, goes into a basal ganglia part. It's attached to a wire that runs underneath your scalp. So you don't see any of this. It runs underneath your scalp down to um, basically a pulse generator, kind of like a pacemaker that generates electricity. And the goal is that when it generates electricity, it flows up the wire, to the electrode, and this electricity disrupts the abnormal activity that's causing your symptoms. That's how deep brain stimulation works in simple words, okay? And then um, it's a two-stage surgery. So the first part is putting the electrodes in the brain. And then the second part, which happens about a week later is when they put this pacemaker-like device um, into the chest. And then you come back, and then we give you a remote control where you can use to um, actually change your programming, but we teach you how to do that. But you come back to us and we program the deep brain stimulation device to set the amount of stimulation parameters that we want um, to help you um, control the symptoms, okay? And that's a simple way of describing this procedure. So what does it treat? It treats several symptoms of Parkinson's. Very um, excellent at treating these. Tremor, bradykinesia, which is the slowness of movement, the rigidity, the motor fluctuations that I described, and it treats dyskinesia. They treat these things very well. What does it not treat? It does not treat cognitive problems. It does not treat speech problems. It will not treat your mood or anxiety problems. It does not treat gait problems. Unless your gait problem is responsive to levodopa, otherwise it does not treat it. It does not treat freezing of gait, unfortunately. And it does not treat the balance problems, okay? It's ideal for um, people who are very responsive to levodopa. So if you have good response to levodopa, you're going to respond well to deep brain stimulation. If you're someone who just never responds to levodopa, I don't think there's a surgeon out there who would want to do surgery on you because you're unlikely to respond to deep brain stimulation also. So it's we want to see someone who definitely has Parkinson's disease. They're responsive to levodopa. They're otherwise healthy. They don't have significant cognitive impairment. Their mood is stable. They have good support. And they have realistic expectations that deep brain stimulation is not a cure. Okay, um, it will help improve your symptoms, but it's not going to cure your disease and it's not going to remove your symptoms 100%. What are some complications? This is the one that everyone worries about. But most commonly, um, the, the surgical complications are very rare. Um, you can have hemorrhage, which is less than 2% of the time. Stroke can occur, which is again, less than 2%. Um, There's a zero to 15% chance of having infection um, due to a new device in your brain. Um, and then seizures can also occur. Um, and then side effects from the deep brain stimulation itself depends on the amount of stimulation. So if I, stim if I crank up the stimulation, I can give you a side effect. For example, your speech can get slurred. If I turn it back down, the side effect goes away right away. So you can get um, side effects just based on how much stimulation I'm giving you, okay? And these, these are some of the different side effects. So speech can get infected, infected, um, affected. Um, you can have drooping of the eyelid. You can have pulling of the face. This is based on how much stimulation I'm giving you. But again, we try to avoid these, okay? And we try to give you the stimulation that will treat your symptoms but not give you side effects. Very infrequently, rarely, I've only seen this done once. There may be a need to revise the deep brain stimulation if it was not placed correctly. Or some people, um, someone may want it to be removed because it was a complication, infection, or the electrode was not placed correctly. So if you're someone who's seeking to have this surgery, you want to make sure that you go to a surgeon who's very experienced and has um, and has um, good numbers. Um, so you want to have that conversation with your movement surgeon's doctor and your surgeon. The other surgical um, non-invasive intervention that we have is called high intensity focused ultrasound. So this is newer, about five, six years newer. Deep brain stimulation is about 22 years 
old, so we have more experience with deep brain stimulation, but we have some experience with high intensity focused ultrasound. Um, it's approved for tremor predominant Parkinson's since 2018. Um, and basically what the surgery does is that it's non-invasive and in layman terms, they're basically shoot, shooting a laser to the basal ganglia part of the brain to create a very tiny lesion and disrupt that abnormal electrical activity. It works very well. Um, it's a single procedure. We only do it on one side. Um, there's no need for opening up the brain. There's no need for putting a pacemaker. There's no need for coming back to do any programming. It's just a one-time thing and it works well for um, controlling tremor. However, because this is newer, we do not know the longevity yet. We're still studying to see how long is it going to control the symptoms, okay? And this current research that's being done to um, see if it treats other symptoms of Parkinson's besides treating the tremor. Okay, so this is a good surgery for people who may have some contraindications to deep brain stimulation. For example, someone who has significant cognitive issues um, and does not, and is not um, eligible to do deep brain stimulation. This is something else to consider. And then treatments of non-motor symptoms, okay? This, there's not enough attention paid to them, but the non-motor symptoms can be as, or even more debilitating than the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. And I've listed here for you guys the different things that we, the different medications that we consider um, and strategies that we use to treat them. So REM sleep behavior disorder, melatonin and clonazepam work well for it. Um, urinary frequency and urgency. Um, Myrobregron is a newer medication that can help, um, but these are also other older medications um, that can help treat um, urinary problems in Parkinson's, cramps or dystonia, I recommend doing botulinum toxin. Restless leg is common in Parkinson's, and these are some of the treatments. Insomnia, trouble sleeping, very, very common. I put all my patients on melatonin. It works about half the time, I would say, and if it doesn't work, then we have also other medications um, uh, that we can try. If you're someone who's having trouble sleeping, make sure you do not have um, sleep apnea. That can be um, a main cause for having trouble sleeping in Parkinson's. Daytime somnolence, make sure we treat the insomnia first. And then we have other things that we can recommend, um, such as modafinil, drinking caffeine. Um, again, CPAP at bedtime um, can be helpful if you're someone who has um, sleep apnea. Constipation, very, very common in Parkinson's. Um, I recommend a, a, a very healthy diet that has high fiber, lots of prunes, um, to help lots of vegetables um, and then taking stool softeners probiotic i like to give my patients the rancher recipe um, i stand by this recipe it works very well for constipation if you google rancher recipe for constipation you'll find it it works very very well drooling i recommend um, botulinum toxin it's very simple to both parotid glands um, and you'll be in and out of the office in 10 minutes um, but there are other things that we can also try that can be helpful some of these have side effects which is why we like to go to botulinum toxin first Orthostatic hypotension, which is the drop in blood pressure. We first recommend doing behavioral modifications, making sure you're drinking a lot of water, making sure that um, you add a little salt to your food to bring your blood pressure up, making sure that you review all your medications. If you're on any blood pressure medication that you may not need anymore, it may be time to stop it because it's probably contributing to the drop in your blood pressure, okay? Um, propping your legs up during the day, um, it's very helpful because it can help blood flow back up where it needs to be. Um, and then at nighttime, people with orthostatic hypotension, their blood pressure tends to go up. So then they get hypertension at nighttime. So when you're sleeping at night, make sure you prop up your pillows so that you're not completely flat and your brain is not seeing all that high blood pressure. Okay, it's a way to protect your brain. And then there are other medications that we also have to treat um, hypotension and Parkinson's. Sexual dys dysfunction, so Denafil can be helpful, also known as Viagra. Cognitive impairment, um, we have medications that can be helpful, Donepezil and Rivastigmine, Galantamine, these can, all can be helpful for that. Hallucinations or psychosis, whenever anyone develop these symptoms, we have to make sure first that they don't have anything causing it, such as a urine infection, um, a metabolic disturbance, um, something else going on. If we rule out all those things, then we can try and do medications. We may have to reduce the medications, um, but then um, there are medications that we use to treat this, such as um, quetiapine, also known as serocol, clozapine, pimavenserin, which is the only FDA-approved medication for Parkinson's disease um, related hallucinations, um, psychosis, and delusions. Okay. Um, depression, very, very common in Parkinson's. We have many medications that treat that, usually SSRIs. Um, anxiety, again, SSRIs can be helpful. Apathy, which is lack of motivation, reverse stigma can help for that. Fatigue, um, fatigue can be caused by so many different things. And this is a loaded question, but we have medications that can help that. Um, pain, um, 
again, caused by many different things. If it's pain that's related to wearing off of symptoms, we can try levodopa for that. Um, and then exercise can also help improve the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, not just the motor symptoms. So again, another reason why I encourage all my patients to make sure they're always exercising. And then there's a lot of research and clinical trials being done in Parkinson's disease. We do a lot of clinical trials in our institution. Um, the goal of this talk is not to talk about the research. We can do that at a different um, talk, but I just want to list for you guys the different research that we're currently doing um, in our institution. And I'll just skip through that because we are running out of time. Um, and then resources for Parkinson's disease. These are some of the organizations that I often um, um, send my patients to, you know, go on the website. There are many, many resources out there. Parkinson's disease affects millions of people um, in the world. So a lot of money has been put into it. And, uh, and these organizations are very active um, in Parkinson's disease. So I often send all my patients to um, reach out to these organizations for even more resources. Um, I, I'm highlighting this because I like the American Parkinson's Disease Association on their website. Um, um, they have these virtual events, um, basically daily exercise classes. Uh, each day there are at least three or four classes that they're doing. And this is a nice example. They have chair yoga, dance for Parkinson's, sing glass for Parkinson's. This is all free for people with Parkinson's. All you have to do is just go on their website, apdaparkinson.org. This is another um, example, Parkinson's Foundation. They also have different exercise classes. They have Mindfulness Mondays, Wellness Wednesdays, Fitness Fridays, so many resources out there. Um, and then I also wanna highlight our institution here at Cornell. We also do our own um, exercise programs, support groups, um, art therapy. We offer many different things for our patients um, just to keep our patients active and engaged and also provide a community uh, for all of our patients. That was the last slide of my presentation. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, it's 12.57, but I'm going to stay on to answer any questions that uh, you guys may have. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Okay. okay. Hi, this is Patricia Bileman. Can you hear me? Yes, I yes, can. Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Could you please, this is a, Terrific lecture. Thank you so, so much. Thank Could you. you please address you. the mechanism of how exercise helps slow progression, how it influences the brain? Yes, 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 yes. Um, yes. Um, not exactly. Not exactly. Sure. Based based on, on mice, mice models. models. Um, um, so, so what they found is that, that in mice, mice with with Parkinson's, Parkinson's, they found they that, that um, um, neuroplasticity was improved, improved and dopamine transmission was improved. And so we and stipulate, so we stipulate that, that this would be the pain for our uh, human beings. Um, um, and we and find, we find that literally, literally looking at looking our patients, that the that ones who exercise, exercise just do better. better. They look they better, better, they look better. And so it doesn't take anything away from you to exercise. So we tell everyone to exercise, but studies have not been done in human beings to show that it actually is slowing down. This is based on mice models. Um, it's a very harmless thing to do. So we, I recommend it for everyone. Dr. Nabogi, um, you have a couple of um, questions in the chat as well. Okay. Can uh, a zone have a pacemaker and a deep brain stimulator? I think they meant, can someone have a pacemaker? and a deep brain stimulator. Um, I don't think I've seen a patient who has both, um, but I think that it should be fine. The pacemaker um, can sit on one side of the chest and then your deep brain stimulator pause generator can sit on one side. You only need one. Um, if you have both sides, um, if you have surgery on both sides, they connect to one wire that comes down to one. Um, so I think you can have both, but don't quote me on that. It's something I have to look up because I don't have a had a patient who has both actually. But I think it should be fine. Um, the next question from Fiona Davis is, what is the earliest age you recommend starting levodopa? Um, so when we start levodopa, um, it's based on certain factors, okay? When someone comes into us and they get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, you don't have to start treatment right away. Okay, starting treatment depends on many different things. Um, when someone comes to us and they tell us, you know, okay, I have this tremor, I'm a little bit slow, but you know what, I'm able to go to work, I feel fine, um, I'm able to take care of my kids, I'm able to do my job. Um, we don't start medication, you don't need medication. I just tell my patient, go and exercise. Okay, um, we only start medication if your symptoms are impairing your functionality. All right, 
Now, the choice of medication depends. So for someone who has a younger onset Parkinson's, let's say if you're in your 40s, early 50s, I would say we do dopamine agonists first and we hold off on doing levodopa. Levodopa is the strongest medication we have. Um, it's the best medication we have. And so I think for someone who's younger, we try to do the other things before we add on levodopa. Just trying to stretch out the options and the, the, how long we have to give you all these different medications, okay? Um, and so we try those other medications first, and then we add on levodopa once if the symptoms start to get worse and worse um, to the point that we, we need the big guns, levodopa, um, then we do. Um, if someone comes to me and they're already significantly debilitated, they're shaking so much, not able to move well, I start with levodopa right away because the goal is to make sure that you have your best function, you have the best quality of life, regardless of what stage of the disease you're, you, you're, um, you're in or what your age is. So the starting levodopa depends on what your symptoms look like and how your functionality is being affected. So there's no specific age um, to start levodopa. I hope that answers um, the question. Um, Allison Edwards asked, uh, thank you. Can you, I think they meant pull, pull up the slide about new, new research that you did not have time for. Um, of course, let's see if I can share my screen again. And I believe this is being recorded, it's still recording. So you're going to have this presentation um, um, posted on the website. Can you guys see my screen? I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Um, I, okay, good. So this is um, the list of research that's being done um, currently at our institution. Um, and since someone asked about it, I'll just quickly go over them um, very briefly. Um, so the first one is called RAPIDS. It's a study that we're doing for people who do not have Parkinson's disease, but they have that REM sleep behavior disorder that I described. Um, and it's just monitoring them and following them over the years to see how their symptoms progress and if they eventually develop the symptoms of Parkinson's. Studies have shown that older adults who have REM sleep behavior disorder are, are at a very high risk of developing Parkinson's disease or one of the other Parkinsonisms. The number is somewhere around 81%. Um, of them eventually develop Parkinson's um, disease or one of the other um, diseases in about 15 years. Um, so it's a very high percentage. It's a very specific uh, biomarker for developing um, one of these Parkinsonisms. Um, so that's what that study is doing. At last is another study that we're doing. It's an observational study that just follows people who have Parkinson's and it just characterizes their clinical um, bio biological and cognitive measures. Uh, and we just follow these people over time. And um, we have these group of people in a repository and we see if they're eligible for other clinical trials. So it's just an observational study. STEM PD. This is one of our hottest studies right now. It's a phase one study to assess the safety and tolerability of stem cells. Um, um, stem cells for advanced Parkinson's disease. So in uh, simple terms, basically we're injecting stem cells into the brain to see if they regenerate and hopefully become dopamine making cells to help improve the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It's a phase one study. So the study is only, is mainly testing for its safety and tolerability. In the future of phase two study will test for how um, efficacious um, this, this treatment is. Um, and so if, if you're someone who has advanced Parkinson's disease and you're interested in study, please do let us know. Um, Enteric NS is a study that um, my colleague is doing um, and uh, uh, she's looking at the uh, uh, pathology and the types of bacteria in the gut um, and to see if they serve as an indicator of Parkinson's disease. Um, GBH genotyping is a study that we're doing to do genetic testing and see if uh, someone with Parkinson's disease has the GBA mutation specifically. Um, it's very simple. You come to our office, we draw blood and we test for that gene and then we let you know um, um, if, you're, if, you, if, you're, if you have that gene. Um, and the goal for this is that if you have that gene, you can be a candidate for future clinical trials that are testing treatments specifically for that gene. Um, the SPARC study, it's a phase two study and it's testing a medication. It's a drug um, that potentially has, um, it has a potential of slowing down disease progression in Parkinson's, okay? It's a phase two study that's looking for um, efficacy of this drug. It's for people who have early Parkinson's. Boundless is a, it's a phase three study that's testing subcutaneous levodopa. So remember I told you guys that there are different forms of levodopa. There's the pill form, the gel form, the inhaled form. This is now another form. It's, sub, it's, a, it's an infusion um, and we're going to compare people who get the infusion um, and then compare it to um, getting the pills to see um, how this new type of um, levodopa, how it helps control motor fluctuations in Parkinson's. Topaz is a 
It's a randomized controlled trial. It's testing zolidronic acid, which is a, um, an injection uh, to prevent fractures in people with Parkinson's. So this is a medication that's already used for um, osteopenia, osteoporosis, and we're using it specifically for preventing Parkinson's to see if it reduces um, the risk of fractures if you fall. Um, this is our prevail study. Um, this is a study to assess the safety and celebrity of, um, this is a gene therapy for people who have um, the GBA mutation. Um, and it's to see um, if its effect on immunogenicity, um, biomarkers, and certain efficacy parameters in Parkinson's. So it's a study to see if this drug um, is helpful for people who have the GBA gene um, in Parkinson's. And then and LIPD is a study for people who have sleep problems in Parkinson's to see if light therapy will be beneficial for them. Um, and if you have any interest in any of these studies, do let us know um, um, and we will go through a scanning process with our research coordinators um, to see if you're eligible for any of these studies, okay? All right, I'm going to stop share again. And I'm back. Um, any other questions, feel free to ask. I think we're out of questions. That means I did a fantastic job. Dr. Namobi, you did a fantastic job. And I cannot thank you enough for doing this for us again. Thank um, you so much. We yeah. truly appreciate it. And um, you can come back anytime. I will. <laughs> Excellent program. Excellent program. Thank yes. you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, everyone.